Good morning, church. Christ is risen. So good to see you all here today. I just want to acknowledge Catherine Yengo. Very proud of you for Friday. You did amazing. And yeah, you just spoke so well and the Spirit of God was speaking through you on Good Friday. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen the message or listened to it, go on YouTube because that sets the foundation from which I'm talking today. Uh, Also for Dan Edwards, last week spoke on faith. And so I just feel like this message will build upon last week's message on faith and Friday's message of faith the crucifixion. When I was 14, it must have been about October, the sun was coming out at mum's place and so I was getting keen to get in the pool and I had one of my best friends over at the time, his name was Keelan Grosvenor, <laughs> Gary and Sarah's son. He, he became my best man and he's still a great friend today. And we were having a nice day in the pool. And then I found out, we found out that my mum and his mum had signed us up to a camp over, <laughs> over New Year's. And we weren't too keen. It was about a four or five day camp. And we heard a little bit about it, that they take your phones for most of the day. There's some camp t-shirt and we're like what is this cult we're going to (laughs) and so as 15 16 year olds we were probably more talk than walk but we were thinking about if we weren't liking it how we could get sent home from camp (laughs) again more talk than walk but we actually enjoyed the camp Um, and this must have been a year or two later but um, I was with Keelan and, and I was with another friend and on the first, so this is um, at my second or third time now in the camp. And on the first night of the camp, we're in Mount Barker, we went for this big night hike. There's two to three hundred young people walking through Mount Barker and um, it's just a great opportunity to hang out with your friends, meet people and just chat. And then afterwards, we go and have some worship, and there's some testimonies, and there's some supper, and that's the end of the first day of the camp. But somehow the topic of God came up as we were walking, and I started to open up about how I felt God was so distant, how I'd grown up in a Christian home and and had heard about God, but was at the stage where I was, you know, willing to walk away from that, And, you know, all those questions that we've all asked, why is there suffering if there's a good and loving God? All these questions, insert your own, that we may have or may have once had. And anyway, that first night went, at the time I was doing some footy pre-season and we would do a 2K time trial before a three-week Christmas break and then we'd do one at the end when we came back from our break, so so at the start of January. And so if you ran a slower time um, post-Christmas than pre-Christmas, the the coach assumed that you were drinking beer and eating salt and vinegar chips and you weren't doing your running. (laughs) And so we... um, The next morning, I actually woke up early and with someone else who was at the camp a few years older, who actually happened to go to the church I was going to at the time, an Anglican church. We got up early and I had to do a running session while everyone else was still sleeping because I didn't want to come back after the Christmas break running a slower 2K time trial. The worst part of pre-season. And we were just warming up, kicking the football and this guy started to share aspects about his life that seemed to connect with me. I'm like, I don't even know why he's talking about this, but I can kind of relate to what he's saying. I can't even remember. This was 10 years ago. I can't even remember what he was saying, but I was connecting to it. Anyway, we'd had 
showered up, had breakfast, and then we were in the morning session and we were in worship. Now, I grew up never really connecting with God during worship. We used to sing a lot of hymns, and as a kid, my goal was to see how low my vo voice could go or how high it could go. Be thou my vision. The sun. <laughs> I won't, continue. <laughs> I won't continue with that, but that was me as a kid. I didn't connect with God in worship. But the lyrics came up, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me, and it hit me here. Just a little jab. I was like, whoa, there's something in that. Anyway, that day had gone, the next day had come, and this is New Year's Eve, and the tradition of this camp, CE camp, is that each year from 9 to 12, they have an extended worship night where people share testimonies about how God has been working in their lives. And you can imagine in a room of two to 300 people, a lot of people go through stuff that's hard. But the testimony was how Jesus had come into those situations and it was quite an emotional night and then towards the end of the night we were um, just finishing up in worship and the presence of God was so strong and I was there just lifting my arms in worship for the first time and I just felt this flood go through me from top to bottom and I was just absolutely bawling and weeping uncontrollably, uncontrollably for about 15, 20 minutes. And I knew that God was saying, here I am. I am the one that you're seeking. I'm the one that you're asking, do you exist on that night hike? And I felt such a conviction of my sin and the way I was living my life apart from God but at the same time being embraced by such love, by such mercy, by such forgiveness. And at the time, there were some tough situations going on in my own life, and a lot of that weight was just released. When I was about 12, my parents divorced, and I think because I had some great friends at the time, some good support, and I had sport and all these things to distract me. I didn't realize how much it had impacted me, but the weight of that just was washed away. And it had passed midnight. They do a bit of like a supper and a bit of a dance party, and you can hear in the background everyone just loving the new year. And I've just gone, and I felt to go and have some quiet time with God. And this is at Cornerstone College in Mount Barker, and there's this big slope and I was sitting there and I could just overlook their main oval and you could see the hills in the background and the stars were in the sky and I just felt awe. Just wonder, this 16 year old boy just sitting there and for the first time in my life, I felt free. I felt peace. There was no anxiety. And that moment changed my life forever. And so I am a living testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. None of you knew me before that day, Gary and Sarah and my parents. None of, none of you knew me. You don't know what I was like. But... I have nothing to boast but in Jesus Christ. So let's share about this good day. Part one, why the resurrection? Again, Catherine gave so much context on Friday. I encourage you to view that. And in the passage she shared from Isaiah 53, 6, such a prophetic and accurate passage of what Jesus was to go through on the cross and his purpose and mission in the cross. But this strikes me. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. 
Each of us has turned to our own way. If you ask, how do you define sin? This is pretty, it's pretty good. All of us have just turned our back on God. If that's not clear, Paul says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Can anyone stand before a holy God and say, I have not sinned? Can anyone look God in the eyes and say, I have no need of you? Psalm 103, 10 to 12. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How does, sorry, how does God treat our sins? He casts it as far as the east is from the west. Any mathematicians in the room? Can anyone measure how far the east is from the west? We've got the earth and east is from the west. It just keeps going on and on. Yet so many of us are still in this tangle. Am I right with God? Am I not? It's clear, folks. This is what Jesus has done. He has removed our sin as far as from the east is from the west. You cannot find it. It's been dealt with in his death and resurrection. How does he not treat us as our sins deserve? John 1, 17 to 18, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. The word for grace in the Greek is charis, which simply can mean the Lord's favour, that he freely extends to us to give himself away for us. It is also our empowerment, but we'll follow that later. But it is clear if we're going to understand the significance of the resurrection, we need to understand who is Jesus. He is God himself. He exists outside of time. Before the world was created, there he was with the Father in closest relationship. And what was Jesus' mission? to make the Father known. A lot of people respect Jesus who haven't given their heart to him. People of different worldviews, whether it's a different religion or whether it is from an atheist background, but they're like, yeah, we can respect him. But if we're to truly respect Jesus, we need to take him seriously because he makes some serious claims. In John 14, 6 to 7, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do do know him and have seen him. And I've covered this in my last couple of messages I've shared, but the Greek word for know is gnosko. When we are as Westerners, when we talk about what it means to know something, it's often about reciting facts or, you know, what's the capital city of Germany? And I know the answer, but this is more than that. Jesus says, if you know me, the actual understanding is to know through personal experience. And so I've had people in my life say, well, you've only received Christ because you grew up going to church. 
but it's, it's not church, it's not a book that transforms our life. It is encountering Jesus. Do we not see that when we read the Gospels, when they see Jesus? It, when Jesus says in, the, in verse 7, he says, we've seen him now. We've seen the Father. We've seen Jesus. And we are to know, God wants us to know him personally through relationship. And I had that amazing just experience of that flood where it was just without doubt. But over the last 10 years, so much of my relationship with God is just in the still, small voice. It's in church before when you can feel just his presence. When I'm at home with Mary praying and I can just sense that gentle whisper. When I read the word of God and I ask, Lord, show me your word, transform me by your word. And it's when I read something that I, it just didn't make sense, but now it makes sense. There's so many ways that we can encounter God, but day by day, he wants us to know him. Jesus says, if you really know me, not just you can say, I was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and was buried. Yes, we are to know that intellectually, but it's in our hearts. And we do know him because he's made himself known. Another big claim he makes in John 11, 25, 26 is, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked this question to Martha. When she's questioning him, I know that you have the power to heal my brother. Why did you not come? He's dead. And Jesus says, your brother will not end in in death. And so Jesus ends up raising Lazarus from the dead. But it was also a foreshadow. It was a taste of of what was to come when Jesus would raise from the dead. Jesus asked Martha this question. But he also asks every human being from that moment, do you believe this? It's not your parents' faith that saves you. It is not being dragged along to church. It's you in your heart with Jesus, man to man, woman to man, That is the answer that we all are faced. The resurrection is both a present reality, but it's also a future promise at the same time. Jesus has been raised from the dead and we have new life in him, but there's more to come when he comes one last time. Who else makes the claim, I am the resurrection and the life? Which other God? Which other worldview? Not only is he resurrection, he is life. If you want to live, receive Christ. Do you believe this? On the other hand, Paul the Apostle says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Literally, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, let's... A literal waste of time. It's labouring in vain. But he's been raised. Our preaching is not useless. Our faith is not useless. So did he actually rise from the dead or not. 
On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Skipping to verse 10. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what had happened. As we go to the next part, I just want to make note that verse 10 is so significant. In an ancient document, if you were to record women, when you're trying to make an absolute truth claim, the testimony of women was often not considered valid. Does that make sense? So if you're trying to make up a story that Jesus rose from the dead, you don't get women to testify about it. You get respected men, people who are educated, people who've done the right study and have the right claim and authority so that you stand on that lie. But how good is God that he brings equality to man and woman. Women are so special in Christ. There is no male or female. We are equal. Just the fact that women were the first to go to that empty tomb shows that it actually happened. Moving on a little bit later, while they were still talking about this, that is the apostles, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Where'd you come from, Jesus? They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. I've just felt to bold and words such as doubt, did not believe, did not believe, nonsense. Um, we're going to get to that, but it's just interesting how much it talks about faith, belief, or unbelief. So just make note of that. Moving on, Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Witnesses. It's not a blind faith. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. What's that? Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with what? Power from on high. Do you know what's amazing? These people are still just battling what's just happened and Jesus is already commissioning them. The forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins is central to the message of Christianity. That's part one. Remember Psalm 103. God has dealt with our sins as far as the east is from the west. You can't even measure it. But God doesn't want us to stay there. 
We never lose sight of that reality. Every day we grow in it more and more. But there's so much more. So much of the church has just thought that salvation means I'm forgiven and now I wait and I just live my life until Jesus comes again. But Jesus is already getting into it. He gives us purpose. I'm going to send you. With what? More of me. I'm sending you Holy Spirit. He's going to fill you. He's going to teach you. He's going to show you the way. He's going to empower you beyond your human understanding. To what? To reach the ends of the earth. We couldn't be here hearing about Jesus in Australia if they were not faithful to what Jesus had said. The fact that Christianity is burning bright today is a testimony to the resurrected Christ. Repentance, what does that mean? The Greek word metanoia, it literally means a change of mind, but it's more from the heart, and it's just a conviction that of sin before God, and it leads to change. That's what I experienced that very first time I shared on that camp. I, was, I felt so convicted, but I gave that to Christ, and I was felt I felt so much love. But we're called to continually repent because we still, even though we have the resurrected Christ living in us, we still fall short of his glory at times. So we're called to just repent, to change our mind. When has our thinking lost sight of the cross, of Jesus, of his resurrected spirit? Come back to him. God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Some people might say, well, why couldn't there be another sacrifice? Because we needed a perfect sacrifice to deal with sin and death once and for all. The perfect son of God in all his innocence was slain that by the power of his blood, our sins we can no longer find. Because at a spiritual level, they've gone as far as the east is from the west. That is why Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only means to have a fulfilling life. Which other worldview compares to our God? Amen. It had to be Jesus. It couldn't have been anyone or anything else. And so that's part one. And to finish the importance of faith, I really felt God put this scripture on me a few weeks ago. Romans 4, 16 to 25. Therefore, the promise comes by faith. So simple. So that it may be by grace, what? God's favor. He freely gives. We can't earn it. And may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law. What does that mean? To those who are of Jewish descent. But also to those who have the faith of Abraham. In Genesis 15, God reveals himself to Abraham and he's He's an old man who doesn't have any children and he says, through your descendants, you're going to have many nations. God is the God of the impossible. So if you've received Christ, we are into this nation of Israel We come under the faith of Abraham. And that's why Paul says he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, not just Israel. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, 
the God who gives life to the dead and calls into things being that were not. Can we please grasp this in our hearts? Against all hope, Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. He's a hundred. Sarah's like a (laughs) hundred. Who's going to give birth at a hundred? You've got osteoporosis. The pelvis is going to (laughs) break. Where's the hope? But Abraham just believed. And do you know what's amazing? If you look at Abraham's life, he still made some mistakes. But he didn't let those mistakes weigh him down. Those mistakes revealed how much he needed the Lord. And he came to the point where he's like, Lord, that ain't make sense but I trust you. In Hebrews, it talks about Abraham's faith. It says that he reasoned that God in his power would raise Isaac from the dead. And he gave this son who was born and somehow to be a father of many nations, including you and I. But God said, don't sacrifice the boy. Here's the sacrifice. Now I know that you fear me. Now I know that I can trust you with the promise. Abraham did not waver through what? Unbelief. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Remember, this is the man where it says against God all hope. He did not waver in unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. What does true faith look like? It's at the heart being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That it, that, sorry, This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone. Do you know what's amazing? God said, Abraham, you are a righteous man because of your faith. What's been the story of the church for so long? I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do this, I got to do that. What's the story of Islam? I got to do this, I got to do that. What's the story of the world? I got to do this, I got to do that. What's the gospel? Faith. Faith yields righteousness. Unbelief says you got to do this, you got to do that. I really hope you don't have my voice in your head while you sleep tonight. (laughs) But it was not for Abraham alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for what? For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So even though I'm still not perfect, 
When God looks at me, he sees the blood of Jesus wash over me and he sees Jesus in my place. So we can have faith that we've been set free, amen? That's your testimony. That's my testimony. The word unbelief in the Greek, apistia, it means unfaithfulness or withholding belief in the power and promises of God. So many of us come to Christ in, be- in belief, in faith, but for different reasons, unbelief comes in. And what happens, we don't, even though we might say it, our heart and our actions don't reveal that we truly believe in the power and promises of God. All of us are tempted with unbelief every day. Unbelief, in my opinion, is the great sin. It is the block. God wants to pour out, but he just says, I want a a faithful vessel. But when unbelief comes in, it prevents us from having the most intimate walk with Jesus that he wants us to have. And it prevents us from being sent in the calling that all of us have to bring this good news to those around us. You don't need a pulpit to bring the good news of Jesus. Wherever he's placed you. Are we a body of believers who live by faith? Or has unbelief dominated our hearts? Coming in for landing, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, in the heart, conviction, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe, not the left ventricle, not from the arch of the the aorta, not the coronary vessels, but it is your spiritual heart, the essence of who we are, that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. That is the reality of the resurrection. Amen. We don't need to stay in shame. Jesus has paid the price. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, this is a two-way tango, my friends. Jesus offers the first dance. He calls us. He doesn't force us. That's the beauty of it all. If you don't want him, he'll say, okay. But we're still in our sin. We're dead. He wants all of us. It's between your heart and his what you decide to do. That's step one. And then it's between your heart and his what you do from that moment of salvation. Walk in faith, live in unbelief. We're not going down the path of unbelief, are we? Because it's all by grace. We can just turn to God, remember repentance, change our mind, Lord. I'm sorry for unbelief. Forgive me, and I want to walk in your righteousness, in the power of your spirit. Simple. Move on. It's been brought up a couple of times today, and I wasn't actually going to include it, but the Lord really put it on my heart to bring this slide in. He wants us to know him 
and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Remember, Jesus said to his disciples, you'll be clothed with power. Do you know that that's the same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead? That power is in us. The reason why we often don't see it is because unbelief creeps in. And we're not walking in intimacy with the Lord. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, our sins have been forgiven. Part one, part two, as far as the east is from the west, that's the same measure of power we have. But it's when we yielded to God. None of us, none of us have power. None of us can raise anyone from the dead. None of us can heal sickness. He can. And the beauty of the gospel is he doesn't only want to just save us and say, live the rest of your life for 60 years and twiddle your thumbs and go through the motions and then I'll come back and it will be a dance party then. He's saying it's a dance party now. I've called you to co-labor with me in bringing the good news to the nations. What are we going to do with this truth? Are we going to live in unbelief or are we going to partner with Christ in belief? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? It's not just when we first come to him, but it's a day by day question and response. To finish, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's not even just the forgiveness of sins. It's complete. It is freedom. When we look at the world, do we see true freedom? When I was a teenager at high school, freedom was underage drinking. It was relationships. And then so many of my friends who've gone down that path have been desperately unfulfilled. The fake ID at 16... You might have had a good night, but did that leave you lasting fulfillment? We can seek freedom in anything. We can seek freedom in anyone. But it is only in Christ do we truly have freedom. Do you know what is so underrated in this world? Peace. Do we walk day by day with constant anxiety just burning in here? That's how I've learnt when I am anxious. I feel this tension here and it walks with me throughout the day. But even though I had that experience with Christ, anxiety wants to come in. But I feel like over the last nine months, I am the most free in my walk with Jesus than I've ever been. And it's all just been because of his love, his mercy, his goodness, the power of his spirit. All we need to do is hang out with him. Get to know him more. Christianity is not a book. It's a person. It's a relationship. That's why... It's powerful when we meet the person. Just reading a book, just praying prayers, all these, you could do it however many times a day. If it's not anchored to the the person, it's empty. That's why every other religion's empty, because there's no power, there's no true freedom. Do you know what's interesting? Second part of that verse, 
Paul says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I got to do this to be right. I got to do that. Am I really free? Does Christ really love me? If we right now are not walking in peace, in joy, then there's a lot more of resurrection power that needs to go into us. And I put my hand up. I need resurrection power of Jesus. I need him. I need connection with my father. I need to be reminded of the forgiveness of sins. I need to be reminded of my purpose in him being one to know him and just being faithful where he's put me every day. Do not let unbelief creep in. Continue in faith. That is the power of Jesus' resurrection. Just going